Oh, first of all, good afternoon. I hope it's not well, I hope or I do not hope, depends on your perspective, uh, that you're getting a lot of snow in your area. We're still waiting for the Portland storm to hit in Oregon. Not holding my breath. <laughs> well, thank you for joining us for the first session in the data management webinar series. My name is Nancy Leonard and I'm moderating today's webinar. In case we haven't met, I work for the Pacific States Marine Fisheries Commission, uh, where I lead the StreamNet program. PNAP, along with StreamNet, uh, has co-led the planning of this webinar series. And I definitely want to take a moment to thank the planning group, which included 13 people from a variety of organizations who have worked with us uh, for over a year, I believe now, um, getting us ready for this series that has been ongoing for several months now. Uh, we have a great data management talks lined up this month, starting with today's two presentation by Amanda and Stacy, and we will also have additional presentation for the next two Thursday uh, of the month of February. Both of those upcoming webinars will also be starting at one o'clock Pacific time. Today I'm joined by one of my fellow planning group members, uh, Tammy Wilkerson. And I'm sure you'll be seeing her shortly. She works with the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission, and she'll be introducing our speakers for today in just a bit. So just to give a quick overview of our agenda, um, we're going to cover a bit more, uh, a few more tips before we get started. And then we're going to have a, a practice icebreaker uh, session just to get us all warmed up to make sure we all know how to navigate the Teams menu interface. Uh, then we'll have our first presenter, Amanda Whitmere from uh, Stanford University, who will be presenting on the basics of data management plans for research. And then that will be followed by Stacy Shoemaker from the Confederate Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation, who will be sharing with us um, the great work she's been doing along with her team uh, in developing and implementing their centralized data management system. And then we'll wrap it up with an open Q&A question. But first, let's start off with some tips. Uh, most of you have figured out how to mute yourself. If you're on Teams, you just find the little icon that looks like a microphone. The location of this menu bar varies on which version of Teams you're using, uh, but the symbols all look the same. If you are using a phone to join us, uh, you'll be able to mute and unmute yourself using star six. Second set of tip, if you are having trouble hearing me <laughs> right now, if you can see my mouth moving, but you don't hear anything, uh, definitely take a look at the menu. You should look for the three little dots on the menu bar and go to the device setting and you'll be able to adjust uh, your audio options there. The other part I want to point out right now is this other symbol. This is the meeting chat symbol. This is what you'll be using uh, to pose your questions. Uh, we'll be moderating this chat. Uh, you can write in your questions at any time. That won't be a problem. Uh, if it's a um, question related to assistance you need and how to navigate Teams or you're having problems with the audio, the video, uh, we'll be able to address those as they pop up. If you have questions for the speakers, you can place them there as well, and uh, we will make sure that we cover those during the Q&A. You can also use uh, the little hand icon and if you want to actually voice your question verbally and we'll call on you. <clears throat> There's the other little voice, the little hand icon over here. So to get started, um, we're going to do a little bit of a practice run to make sure everyone is on the same page in terms of locating that chat box. So Amy is going to drop in the chat a link for an informal icebreaker uh, poll that we're going to take. So if you can click on that uh, poll that's in the chat and take a bit, a few seconds to uh, provide your answer of your choosing. And then we are going to show you the results. Here are the results coming in. The question is who manages your data? If you have not found the chat, for some reason the link doesn't work for you, you can also go to this website address and then you enter this code and I'll pop up the uh, poll so that you can um, <clears throat> select your answer. I know a lot of data stewards are going to be really sad to see what's going on here. 
it looks like we have a lot of possessive people, just like my cat. <laughs> uh, we're most are selecting for fun. I, I'm the only one that can handle my data. Glad to see that the lawyer kitten is getting some acknowledgement here. Yeah, it looks like we're pretty stable. So it looks like uh, the data is mine is winning, followed by the lawyer kitten. <laughs> And I'll break the news to the data stewards about them coming in last. Although he is a very fancy, sophisticated data steward. Might be a bit intimidating. All right. Well, thanks for taking the time to indulge me with the poll. Uh, now I'm going to pass it over to Tammy, and she's going to introduce today's first speakers. Tammy? Thanks, Nancy. Um, I'm Tammy Wilkerson. I am the librarian for the Columbia River, excuse me, the Columbia Basin Fish and Wildlife Library. Um, it's a program of Cryptic, and I'm here to introduce the speakers. And the first one is my fellow librarian, Amanda Whitmire. She is the head librarian of the Harold A. Miller Library at Hopkins Marine Station. She attended UC Santa Barbara for her bachelor's degree, earned her PhD in oceanography at Oregon State University in 2008, and transitioned into a career in libraries in 2012. Amanda has been with Stanford Library since 2015 and is passionate about rescuing old data and making it discoverable and accessible. She is currently working on curated, uh, curating a 23-year time series of oceanographic data from Monterey Bay and a 50-year corpus of undergraduate student research papers from Hopkins. So take it away, Amanda. Thank you so much, Tammy. Let me just make sure I'm sharing my screen here. Do you see my the presenter view for my slides? Yep, you're good. Fantastic. So thank you so much for having me today. This is um, a really important topic that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, when I first switched over from being a postdoc in oceanography to working in the library. I didn't come in as a librarian. I came in as a data management specialist. So the introduction of a data management plan requirement by NSF especially um, is really a move that launched a thousand job descriptions um, for new positions in libraries related to data. So um, this is this is near and dear to my heart and I'm looking forward to, to talking about this today. So just to give you a sense of, of what we're going to be covering, um, there's some, some common themes across data management plans. I'll, I'm sort of loosely basing what I'm covering today on the NSF BioDirectorate uh, data management plan template, but it's there really is um, common thematic coverage across data management plans. So we'll be covering things like what types of data you'll be producing, metadata, um, how you share, when to share, and so on. But first, we're going to have a little fun um, and help help me get some background on, on you all. So if you could, I think there should be a link in the chat and we will see how you've done, uh, how many of you have done a data management plan before. Good, seeing results coming in. Oh, this is so fun. <laughs> Oh, this is great. OK. It's nice to see that most of you are at the sort of zero to one or two, because I don't want it to be um, too much content that you've heard before. But it's nice that um, some of you are more experienced in this area. Hopefully, I, I think you'll still take something away from it. What's a DMP? We'll cover that. <laughs> this is great. How fun. A couple more coming in. Three to four. Maybe when we get to Q&A, we can talk with folks who've written several of them. I'm always curious how much you adapt and change plans between projects. I've seen a lot of um, copying and pasting, which is great and efficient. And the interesting parts are what you change when you bring on a new project. Well, that's great. Thanks for indulging me in the poll. We'll switch back over to PowerPoint and we'll get into the meat of it. So I like to make sure that we're really starting on a, a common foundation of understanding about what we're talking about. So I'm, I'm stepping back a level from data management plans and just making sure we all understand what data management is. And the emphasis really 
here for me is um, that it's an activity. It's something that you do. Data management is an ongoing process that you're doing all the time. And it's really anything that's related to storage, preservation, and reuse of the data and documentation that you're producing throughout the research lifecycle. And this is, of course, across however many projects you have going at any given time. So within that context, a data management plan is really just a, a formal document specific to each project that you have going generally um, that's mutable, it's changeable. It's something that as your product maybe uh, or your project changes over time, you adapt that data management plan to compensate for whatever changes there are. And the plan just outlines what you're doing with your data both during your project and after you complete your research. And the main goal is to ensure that your data is safe and well managed, um, of course, during your project, but then looking forward into the future. And I find that the, as I've written data management plans myself and I've read data management plans, I've consulted on them a lot, the challenge is really not so much about what areas to cover, because like I said in the beginning, the, the, the thematic content areas of data management plans are, are pretty well described. Um, either by the funder or by tools that are available to make them. It's it's the challenge is knowing what content do I include, right? Like if you're directed to include information about metadata, well, what does that mean? You know, what, what is metadata? What are you supposed to be doing with metadata, right? So that's that's where the challenge lies. Um, so I'll, that's what I'll be going through today is offering some advice um, and resources for what you might want to consider putting in for each section of a data management plan. So let's dive right in. The first section of a data management plan is almost always a description of the types of data and materials that you're going to produce. So it could be um, digital data, physical samples, software that you're writing, curricular materials. Um, it, it could be a really broad range of things. And really the, the reason you start with this is because it lays the foundation for your entire plan. In order to know um, to come up with a plan, you have to understand what you're going to be managing, right? So, so this is the place that you start. And as you think about describing what types of things you'll be generating, it's, it's helpful to be um, to think beyond just variable level. I think as a, as a scientist, I went straight to, well, I'm, I'm going to measure temperature, salinity, oxygen, nitrogen, and all these things. Um, but think a little higher level, too, about is, your, is what you're collecting observational data? Is it experimental data you're doing uh, in the lab? Are you compiling data sets from other sources? Are you um, doing any geospatial work? And so on. So, so it's important to, to think about these things um, because the types of data that you're generating, observational versus experimental, has implications down the line for how you want to think about managing and sharing that kind of data. And I'll and we'll come back to that. So I um, I went looking for a, a publicly available data management plan that we could sort of refer to as we step through the, the different phases and, and um, see what they shared. And so I, I found one through DMP tool. This is a long term research and environmental biology data management plan from a, a project called Drivers of Temperate Forest Carbon Storage from Canopy Closure Through Successional Time. So as um, I imagine lots of people on this call are um, environmental researchers who go out in the field and collect samples and do monitoring. So I thought there was enough overlap. Uh, so in this case, you can see that they, they came up with quite a list of data types that they're going to be generating from physical samples, laboratory data, compiled data sets, and so on. And it's just a really nice, clear, concise list. And that's what you generally want to see in this section. Something we've seen a lot in this first section for data management plans, too, is rather than a narrative, just produce a table of the kinds of data that you'll be generating with, with a little description of each one. This is a really nice, concise way to summarize this information. The second stage of a data management plan is generally uh, a section about standards, formats, and metadata. So um, think about um, file formats, standards for metadata, and so on. And I'll, I'll get into what I mean by that in just a second. So file formats especially are an area of confusion that I've seen in, in reviewing data management plans. So we talked about data types, right, like observational or spreadsheets and so on. The format is the way the data is encoded. So if you have a spreadsheet, right, a qualitative tabular data, 
it could be formatted in many different ways. It could be an Excel spreadsheet, text file, access database, Google spreadsheet, and so on. And so the reason we wanna think about formatting has to do with down the line, how you're gonna share the information, right? If you're using um, an access database, is, is that the most open way to share your data? And there are any number of resources you can head to to um, figure out what the preferred or encouraged file formats are in your area. This is just some stuff that I pulled from the Stanford Data Management website. Um, but really what you wanna think about is you want your data to be usable as far into the future as possible, not just for other people, but for yourself, right? Um, proprietary and closed formats are much more likely to become obsolete. So I don't know if you've ever tried to open up an Excel file from 20 years ago, um, but even if you're still using Excel, you might have some trouble getting that file to open, even maybe from 10 years ago. So as you're thinking longer term and making a plan in your DMP, um, it's, it's a really a good idea to consider file formats. And we'll move right into metadata. This is a, um, an area of uh, much struggle I have found in, in working with researchers in, in making their data management plan. So I'll spend just a few minutes on this. But the way that I like to think about metadata is really nicely summarized by this quote from Oak Ridge National Labs, right? Like think of someone 20 years from now who needs to use your data? What do they need to know to be able to use it properly? Right? So think about, you know, they don't know anything about your project or why you did it. They don't know how you did it and so on. So metadata is all the information they would need to be able to use your data effectively. Some people like to um, say data is uh, like data report. Metadata is data reporting, right? The who, what, when, where, and how of data, it describes the content, the quality, and the condition of the data, its characteristics, and so on. And so um, metadata is a really valuable tool for preserving the use usefulness of your data over time. So it's useful now, it's useful in the future. And just by way of example, um, this is from a, a really nice paper about uh, the development of ecological metadata language which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, but you know, if you were presented with a table that looked like this, I don't think any of us could say with any certainty what that data is supposed to mean, right? Well, if we add some headers to the data table, okay, we kind of start getting an idea. Okay, we have a site and we have a date and we have a plot with some number, still really not sure what those other variables might be. And then if you look to the metadata, which describes that data table, we see that, oh, okay, so the SPs, species, and they have the, um, the full descriptions there, BM is biomass, there's phosphorus, nitrogen, and so on. So the metadata is what provides the context for us to be able to understand what this data table is and use it or not. So beyond just the how we describe a data set, you can take it to another level, which is by using something called a metadata standard or a metadata schema. And really uh, a metadata schema really just sets up a set of common terms and definition and structure that allows for um, consistent and effective use across data sets. So if we have two uh, you know, biodiversity data sets from two different places in the world, but they're using the same metadata schema, it's really easy to combine those two data sets and use them together. So one specific advantage of a metadata schema is that they usually include um, information around using controlled ter terms or an ontology or vocabulary. And so this is an example that I'm, um, using without permission from Mark Schildauer at NCs, um, but it's it's just a really great um, sort of reflection on what the importance of, of metadata can be for, for your project. So consider a situation, maybe you're um, you know, a forest carbon researcher and you're, you're looking for information on leaf litter, right? Well, that's, let's say you do a search for litter. Well, that's litter, right? And the dogs are litter. Oh, and an extra slide in there, right? There's litter. 
that's a litter. I didn't know that actually, but the thing for carrying someone is called a litter. But of course, what you were looking for is leaf litter, right? So a metadata standard allows you to um, really clearly define the word that you're looking for. If you, you might also consider you're searching maybe for carbon dioxide flux. Well, if you search for carbon dioxide flux, the words versus CO2 flux, would you get the same results and why or why not? And so using a common metadata standard with an ontology um, really helps you uh, discover what you're looking for in a much uh, more concise way. And I'll just, I don't wanna go too far into the weeds on metadata, but I just wanna make sure uh, to give you one example. So ecological metadata language is a really commonly used metadata schema. You may also be familiar with ISO 19115, which is a geospatial metadata standard. Um, but these are, this is a, a standard that's really common across ecological data, obviously. And there are at least two R packages you can use for creating EML. There's also a desktop application called Morpho that's not being supported by the developers anymore, but it's still available. You can download it and use it. Um, and, and these tools really um, make using a metadata standard like EML much more approachable. It can seem, you know, if you look at the diagram on the left, that's just the highest level summary. Every single one of those open, expands to a much longer section of descriptive information that you can fill in. So it can get overwhelming, but there are tools available. So this is going into the weeds just a little tiny bit, but I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the FAIR principles. Um, you know, if this was an in-person seminar, I'd, I'd ask for a show of hands, like who's heard of FAIR? And I'd, I'd sort of tailor what I'm I'm uh, covering to that. But, but just, you know, for the purposes of today, I'm just gonna spend a, a minute on this. So FAIR, um, the FAIR, got, FAIR principles were established in, in 2016, and really the intent behind the FAIR principles is to provide some guidelines around um, making data more findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So I'll just review these very quickly. There's a ton of information on this website that I have the URL down at the bottom about FAIR guidelines and how to implement them. But the principles are just that data and metadata should be findable, right? Like you can't use something if you can't find it. And they really highlight how metadata is key in being able to find information. So if you have machine readable metadata, think of searching a catalog, right? Like that's all metadata. Um, that's the first step. And in order for data to be accessible, assuming it's digital data, it has to be um, retrievable, right? So some kind of standardized communication protocol like HTTP or FTP for file transfers and so on. It really starts to get into the crux of things here at, at interoperable. So data, in order to be useful, should be interoperable, meaning it can be used and combined with other data sets, right? And to really, as I was talking about EML and metadata and how it standardizes things, metadata is really key for interoperability. And lastly, in order to be, you know, the whole goal is for things to be reusable, right? So they have some frameworks within the FAIR principles um, that will help you understand how to describe your data and release it. You know, they say to use a license and we'll talk about that. Um, but really, so the take home message here really is that if you are, if you're organizing your data management and sharing around these FAIR principles, you're really gonna be in a strong position to be sharing effectively, managing your work effectively. And if you're if you're writing a DMP in the context of a funding proposal, um, you're really going to be meeting those funder requirements for sharing if you're covering the bases under the FAIR principles. So to come back to the data management plan, what would a section for um, formats and standards look like? So in the if we go back to our carbon storage canopy um, data management plan, it's it doesn't have to be long, right? Like. Metadata is going to conform to ecological metadata standard, and um, it's going to be provided in XML and shared on the environmental data initiative. Um, the only thing that I would say is missing from this section, they don't uh, cover their data formats. So they, they had a really, really nice section about data types in the first section, but here they haven't talked about what formats they're going to be using. 
Um, you might remember that they were talking about taking field observations and lab data, compiled data. So it'd really be straightforward for them to just mention something about sharing data in plain text or CSV. Um, I also would probably recommend in this section that they say something about how EML um, adheres to the FAIR principles by offering machine readable structured metadata. So they, I mean, they talk about XML and being machine readable, but mentioning FAIR goes a long way with reviewers. The section for roles and responsibilities is, is fairly straightforward. You really just want to think through questions like, does anyone, do you depend on anyone for your data? You know, if you have collaborators and they're collecting some aspect of data for your project, have, do you have a shared understanding of what their role is and when they need to provide data to you? How are you dividing responsibilities and so on? You also want to consider if this is in a, you know, a university context, the role of students and postdocs. Are they going to be staying throughout the project and so on? So in this case of the, the data management plan we've been looking at, uh, they actually mention that uh, responsibility will pass on to co-PIs if the PI retires in the case of the project. And I thought that was a pretty thoughtful thing to think about. I haven't actually seen that in any data management plan I've, I've read before. So um, yeah, this is just a, a really straightforward opportunity to, to lay those things out. Okay, methods of data sharing. What, how, and when will you share your data with the community? This is really, really where the rubber meets the road. The whole purpose of your plan, if it's written within the context of a grant proposal or in support of sharing data for publications is also really common, then like this is the whole purpose of your plan is, is how to get your data out into the world. So I'll spend, I'll spend a few more minutes on this than, than our previous sections. So the first thing that you'll have to decide is what to share, right? Do you, the, there really needs to be a critical assessment as you plan your DMP um, for how much of your data can and should be shared. So, you know, expectations from funders and sort of the ethics of open data that are, are building steam in our communities really skew heavily towards sharing everything openly, but obviously reality is a lot more complicated than that. And so I'm going to walk through a couple of um, frameworks for making decisions on, on what to share, and then we'll get to the how and to the when. So depending on the kind of research that you do or where you do it, um, there may be observations of rare or threatened so species there, in your data no set. So what you really have to do is, is make it, undertake an assessment that weighs the risks and the benefits of publishing those data, right? So it's we've definitely seen cases where Sharing data about a rare species has led to poachers um, coming and, and poaching animals for the illegal wildlife trade. Um, in a less extreme case, you know, sharing information on, on eBird or something uh, about a rare bird sighting, you know, could lead to unintended impacts of, of just people trampling through habitats. Uh, but there are obviously a lot of benefits to sharing biodiversity data, right? It, in order to conserve a species and plan for saving a threatened species, you have to have information um, to plan for that management, right? And so good data really helps conservation know, conservation managers know what to do. So like I said, you really have to consider and weigh the risks and rewards of sharing biodiversity data, like species occurrences, for example. Um, and as I've familiarized myself with some of the issues involved, it's really a lot more complicated than just poaching and trampling, right? So just as one example, um, this is a really great paper, by the way. Um, if, if the goal in sharing some of the data that you've collected is to, you know, improve planning for future monitoring by setting up, you know, how you're going to develop a spatial plan and sort of what scale of data aggregation you need, and you share information about, where you collected your work, um, you may unintentionally ha have a conflict with uh, the landowner, right? Who could be a, a private citizen, it could be an indigenous group, and so on, and then they end up limiting your future access, right? So, so there's all these complicated ways that that sharing biodiversity data can can kind of go off the rails. So my my main purpose in bringing this up is just to let you know that there are tools available to help you think through this process of risks versus benefits for sharing biodiversity and monitoring data. So um, I'm not going to walk you through this whole tree. That would be silly, but um, 
you know, it's just to let you know that it exists and is there for you to use. And, and you know, the quote there is important, right? Like the decision tree is not going to make the decision for you, but the role is to help give you a framework, right? To think through the decisions that things you might consider as you figure out what data you can share as you develop your data management. Plan. So the next thing that I want to talk about is the care principles for indigenous data gov uh, governance. So the the fair principles that we talked about earlier really focus on characteristics of the data and how you can develop your data and metadata in a way that emphasizes sharing. The care principles for indigenous data governance are really people and and purpose oriented, right? So these really emphasize um, the role of your work in the co broader context of um, indigenous data and, and um, governance. So it may not apply to your work now, but I think it's important that we all raise our awareness around indigenous data governance, so I'm gonna cover it. So I'm just gonna run through the care principles uh, so they're on your radar. So the first uh, care principle is collective benefit, right? It's like, so data ecosystems, um, and that could be um, sharing platforms, databases, and so on, or even just the way that you collect the data really should be centered around collective benefit. And there's uh, much more detail around all of these uh, on the website, just like with the FAIR principles. The second one is, is authority to control, right? So if you're collaborating directly with indigenous peoples or indigenous groups, um, you really should defer to their authority in, in deciding uh, how data is controlled, not just access, but um, who owns it, where it's stored, and so on. So data for governance, governance for data, and so on. Responsibility is a big one, right? Like if, if you're working with indigenous data, you have a big responsibility to um, support their self-determination and, and really consider the collective benefit. You know, you're responsible down there in the in the list for positive relationships and so on. And lastly, ethics, right? Indigenous people's rights and well-being should be at the center of, of how you consider your work, either in collaboration with them or if you're on um, tribal lands, near tribal lands and so on. Um, I really encourage you to just reflect on these principles, no matter how tangential or irrelevant they may seem to your project. Um, the more I've reflected on these over time, the more I've thought, wow, I, I could have handled certain aspects of my prior work differently if I had just sort of had this in my mind. And just by, by way of example, um, ELOCA, the Exchange for Local Observations and Knowledge of the Arctic, is a, is a formal partnership that involves universities and research groups, observing systems and data repositories and indigenous groups, including the Inuit Circumpolar Council, individual tribes and consortial groups that span the US and Canada, Russia, Northern Europe. And you're not likely to be in a situation that is so clearly well-defined as this, as this partnership, but it's worth keeping in mind that indigenous data can come in many forms. Um, it could be data that's created by, for, with, or about indigenous communities. And so as, as you, maybe as you plan your field work, um, investigate if you'll be on or near designated tribal lands. If you're collecting biodiversity observations, they may be viewed as an indigenous resource. Um, so just reflect on, on whether there are considerations around, you know, what data you're collecting and how they're shared, uh, where they're shared and when. And there's a lot more resources um, at the U.S. Indigenous Data Sovereignty Network and the Global Indigenous Data Alliance. Okay, we're still in the methods of sharing section, um, but we're moving on to how to get this done, right? How do you share your data? And of course, the answer is always, it depends. Um, there are many, many, many options for sharing your data. Um, in terms of data sharing platforms and repositories. So in general, um, think about things like, does your funder require you to use a certain repository? You know, like if you're funded by the NSF um, OCE directorate, they want you to use Bico Demo, right? 
Um, if you're sharing data in support of a research paper, your journal may require you to use a specific repository. Um, in this case, Dryad and Zenodo are very commonly used. Um, does a repository you might use charge for doing data deposits? And if they do, that's something you'll want to budget for in your data management plan. Um, is a repository you're considering, do they offer a, um, a metadata standard or a schema that helps make your data more discoverable? Are they part of a federated um, system of repositories that really helps with discoverability? So, so there's all these things you can consider when you're trying to figure out where to put your data for sharing. And really, I encourage you to reach out to your peers, you know, find out where they're sharing their data, reach out to your librarians. Like I said, many of us um, have data management as like a line item in our job description. So we are we are there to help you with this. And and one uh, further consideration I, I want to um, throw out there, an important thing you want to consider is is how discoverable your data will be. Like how easy is it for someone to find your data? You went through all this work to collect it and to manage it and to document it and share it out with the world. And if you tuck it away on some far corner of the internet, you know, no one's going to find it. Um, so no one can benefit from it. And if you put it in a well-known repository that's in common use in your community, you know, they'll be much more likely to find it. So you have a much better chance. And then sort of the, the pinnacle of data sharing is if you put it in a repository that's networked with other repositories, you have an even better chance of, of your data being discovered. So an example of that would be um, the Data One network. So this is a federation of all of these repositories. I know it's probably small on your screen, but you know, LTR repository, PSCO, Dryad is in there, Ecological Society of America is in there, EDI is in there. Um, down at the bottom left, the Alaska Ocean Observing System is in there. So ELOCA that we were talking about just a few slides ago, they share their data within the Alaska, the AUs system so that all of that data is discoverable through data one so if you if you're looking between maybe two repositories and you see one is in data one and one is not right like like that something like this could be a deciding factor for you so what might that look like um again it's the sharing section uh can be as concise as saying you know we're going to share our data through the environmental data initiative it's part of the data one portal um and that's that's how we're going to share it and really the the main driver of again data management plans and thinking about this before you get started on your research so actually identifying or a sharing platform before you get started is that it's it's pretty likely that the repository you're using will have certain requirements for your data and metadata. And if you know that up front, you're going to save yourself a lot of pain and suffering when you're two years into a project and you realize you haven't been creating the right metadata. And not only is it a ton of time to go back and create it after the fact, you've probably forgotten a lot of really important details. So knowing what to expect and having a plan for sharing up front helps put into place some of those other pieces around um, metadata and, and data storage and so on. So that is how to share. The next two sections um, are a bit shorter, a bit more concise. So, so policies around access, sharing, and reuse. So this has to do with um, setting up really clear um, rules around reuse and redistribution of your work. Um, it sets up uh, rules around if, if you want somebody to cite your work, they uh, you can assign a license to it that, that will require that. Um, and this section also includes anything related around intellectual property, privacy, confidentiality, um, and so on. So here is where, you know, if you have any issues around indigenous data government governance or restrictions due to concerns over a threatened species that you mentioned maybe in the what to share section, you'd want to perhaps refer back and add any specific details around how restricted materials might be accessed um, if possible. Uh, likewise, in this section, if your work is funded by a private company, like when I was at OSU, a lot of the forestry research was funded by timber and lumber companies, you'll want to address the intellectual property agreements you may have with that private company in this section. Um, depending on, on what data repository you use, they may offer or require a data use agreement, and that is considered a barrier to, to reuse. So you'll want to describe how that agreement 
um, functions and, and assure your funder that the intention is, is to make your data as open as possible. Um, if there are any charges for data, it's not common in, in ecological research, more so in business and, and uh, social sciences, but if you're gonna charge for access to your data, you'd include that here and so on. My, my strongest recommendation for the section around um, policies for, for access and reuse is that you assign a license via Creative Commons or one of the other open data licenses to your work. It provides a really concise way of communicating how your data can be reused. So if you want someone to cite your work, you do with Creative Commons Attribution License. If you think you want anyone to use it for any purpose and, and you don't have any concerns, you, you do a CC0. Um, and that way you, you save other people's time because they don't have to email you for clarification about how the data can be used. You save yourself time because you don't have to respond to emails about how your data can be used. Um, and so assigning a, a license that, that lays it all out there really just makes it um, a more efficient process. And then generally the last section of a data management plan is archiving, storage, and preservation. And so um, the, the one thing I would have you remember from, from this section is that the sharing platform that you chose in, in section four under methods of sharing may or may not be the same as your archiving platform. So some sharing platforms or archiving platforms like you know, LTER and any of the national you know, NCEI or any of those, those are archival storage. That is serious, we're gonna keep it for 50 years storage. Um, you know, GitHub is for sharing, it's not for archiving. Putting stuff on a website is for sharing, it's not for archiving. So, so there can be really important distinctions between uh, what you use for archive and what you use for, for sharing. Um, some researchers like to archive their data locally and keep copies locally, and, I, and that's totally understandable, but just keep in mind that that's a really big risk. Um, if you're managing all of your data yourself over the long haul, um, you know, you're gonna wanna get into issues of replication and, and um, how you're gonna fund long-term archiving. Um, if, if you upload your data to a repository, um, it's, it's probably a one-time cost, and that's something you can budget for in your data management plan. If you're constantly having to add more storage for yourself to archive all of your data over time, that's an ongoing cost that you may not be able to cover so easily. So that's, that's pretty much it. Those are the main sections of data management plans. Um, I just would offer as one final recommendation, there are tools for creating data management plans. Um, if, if you're in the US, the DMP tool is fantastic. These are, um, and then DMP online if you're in the EU or the UK. DMP tool, uh, the way these things work is you, you sign into the tool, you log in, and then you pick a specific funder and it could be the Sloan Foundation, it could be the NSF Geo Directorate, it could be NIH, it could be DOD or DOE or anybody. Um, and if there is a template that exists for a funder, it is in DMP tool and you click it and it tells you exactly what that funder wants in their plan. And they do vary um, slightly between organizations. So if you wanna be very careful about making sure you hit all the requirements, it's really fantastic to use these tools. They also provide a lot of information that links out to um, helpful information, for example, about metadata and so on. So it, it helps mostly with what you need to include and links out for more in information on um, the actual content itself. So like, I really can't recommend those highly enough. One thing we didn't cover today was um, during your project storage, backup and organization of your work. DMPs generally do not ask for this level of detail. So if you're writing a DMP for a funder, they're not gonna ask for this. If you're writing a data management plan for your lab group and for your internal work, I really encourage you to consider um, including this kind of information in your plan. And I just have a couple of, um, of really excellent papers to refer you to there with some information on um, things to consider in terms of storage backup and organization. And you'll wanna think about things like file naming and organization and how you do your backups, how you collaborate across platforms for not just for data, but for uh, writing and writing up your projects, how to do code and data versioning, and so on. It's it's all there. So this is this is not generally a part of funder DMPs, but again, I encourage you to um, 
to consider that. And again, this is another one of the areas where, where librarians, um, especially data librarians, can help you come up with a good plan. Sometimes just talking through things is, is really enough to get you, get you going. So that's it for me for today. I'm happy to see you on Twitter, or if you have follow-up questions, uh, I, I'll be happy to, to get emails. But other than that, I will take time for a few questions now and then, and then hand it back. Great, thank you so much, Amanda. Um, we're gonna open it up for questions now, and you can either type your questions in the chat, or you can raise your hand using the icon in the toolbar, and we'll call on you. Um, so we have a couple questions in the chat. First, do you know how data repositories can join existing networks such as Data One? Uh, well, I can't speak to all of the networks, but at least for Data One, um, you, I think you basically just have to email. Um, there is likely to be a contact link on the um, on the Data One webpage. I know there's a, a a page of that website that's all about the member repositories, and you just would email and ask. And they definitely have some requirements around metadata and standards and so on, but they're very helpful at onboarding um, new repositories. So I just encourage you, to, they're very friendly, so I encourage you to get in touch. <laughs> and another question, what if your funder does not have a specific template? Do you know um, if the EMP tool has a general template for developing yeah, data management plan? That's really a, a great question. So. Um, I have to go back and, and look to be sure. I know they have a gen, like an NSF general plan um, that, that could be used for probably just about anything. Um, so I think if, if DMP tool doesn't have like a, an unaffiliated template for data management plan, I would just go for the NSF general. Great. Any more questions for Amanda? Okay, well, thank you, Amanda. Um, and we will now move on to our second presenter. Stacy Schumacher graduated with an MS in Rangeland Science from Oregon State University. She has over 20 years experience in the GIS program with the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation, excuse me. And go ahead and take it away, Stacy. Hello. Hi, so I'm Stacy Schumacher. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here with you. Um, first off, I've got a poll to ask about how you're storing your data. And if you want to go ahead and go to the chat and fill out how you're storing your data, we'll find out some interesting background about the people on the call today. So it looks like there are a lot of users using databases. That is great to see. And then Excel files are coming in second. Excel is pretty popular format. So I'm going to go ahead and jump into the presentation now. Um, so, the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation um, started development of a centralized data management system for storing of natural resources data in 2013. The goal of the system was to promote the use of data for decision making within tribal government. And so today I've got a story for you of how we did that. And really, I just want to highlight that it was me and my supervisor, the director of the Office of Information Technology, and the director of the Department of Natural Resources who said, you know, we really, we really need to do this. We need to get this done. And so we launched into it in 2013. And some background information. The tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation, or CTUIR as we like to say, um, manages over 200,000 acres across Northeast Oregon and Southeast Washington. The fisheries program in the Department of Natural Resources currently collects data across these five basins and the Columbia River corridor. But the tribe's area of traditional use extends beyond multiple states throughout the Northwest. Their areas of interest is quite extensive 
and they do quite a few collaborations on um, management in these in the across multiple states. So I work in the GIS program and our mission is to provide technical support for GIS and information management to programs within the tribal government. We've collaborated with the Department of Natural Resources on many efforts, including the development of our centralized data management system, which we call the CDMS. And with an area of interest so large that the tribes operate across, the Department of Natural Resources has begun collecting more and more diverse amounts of data each year. It became very time consuming to compile the information to make it GIS ready. That struggle is very, very real. And this was a big driver for me for why we needed to standardize and centrally store our information. We were using GIS to display locations of data collections, trends in data, as well as overlaying different types of data to help us better understand population dynamics. And being able to display information in a map format became a frequent request and the time to compile the information often took weeks. So we were writing grants to consolidate and compile information when what we really wanted to be doing was write grants to analyze and present results. And with these struggles in mind, it really helps us solidify the key qualities that we wanted to see in a data management system. And at a minimum, that system had to have importing tools, exporting tools, QA, QC defined protocols, querying tools, metadata, summary reporting tools. We really wanted our system to do a lot of things that a good data management system should be able to provide. And the next step was to identify what would the staffing needs be for an effort such as this. And we identified the required minimum team members consisted of a data coordinator, a data developer, database developer, and the web programmer. This is really the minimum amount of people you would want to have to undertake an effort like this. And I like to think of it as the triangle of efficiency. And what we've seen happen is that the data coordinator has emerged as the base of the operation. We believe this is the key role for the success of development and implementation of a data management system such as ours. So with our vision and our needs realized, we identified a strategy to help us start the development process and ensure some success. The first step was the data coordinator conducted a needs assessment. This was a successful way to familiarize herself with the data and the people who she'd be working with and would be using the system. We then prioritized those data sets and identified that water quality, oral histories, and fisheries data were the top priorities. We followed up our needs assessment with a comprehensive look at our data management strategy and devised a data maturity model. The maturity model not only identifies where we are, but where we want to go. And we're able to justify that the systems that got us to this point aren't enough to take us where we want to go. And so where do we want to go? We want to use technology to access authoritative data and more easily informed decision making. This became a useful document for communicating with management and tracking our progress. We use the agile process for our development style. It was the role of the data coordinator to start the development process by working with the collectors and the users of each data set. And before we released anything to production, the data coordinator went through a rigorous process of development and testing with the working groups. When completed, each working group had to sign off on the process to identify that the CDMS system met their needs for data storage. The process of standardizing the data collections among multiple collectors has been an incredibly valuable process for the organization, and it's led to the successful implementation and use of the system, as well as built confidence in the data. And this information becomes our metadata and informs the developers on the requirements for the billing of each data set in the system. Along with tabular data, the data coordinator identifies the spatial data associated with each data set. Inclusion of geographic features was a must for our system. And now with data in the system, we can easily see the 219 spawning ground survey reaches, reaches that the tribe monitors, or the 635 water temperature monitoring sites, 
there's a large amount of spatial and tabular data being stored in the system. And it allows us to provide access to this data to this authoritative data across multiple platforms. So after seven years of our development process, what have we developed? Well, we've created a data management system that is web based. It's user friendly. It stores standardized authoritative data. It integrates with ArcGIS and it allows for sharing of our data with partners. So let's take a quick look at the nuts and bolts of the system. The database schema is organized in a way that allows each project to only view and interact with their data. Access to the data is managed by user login. Within the system, every row of data is linked to a spatial location by an ID attribute. This gives us the ability to utilize ArcGIS Online data collection applications for collecting data in the field, as well as the use of the web maps to QA, QC data before it enters the system. The beauty of this workflow is it supports telecommuting, telecommuting which is now a requirement due to COVID. The three main components or tiers of the system include the front end Angular JS web interface with a middle tier using C Sharp and ASP.NET to create the web services in the back end. And the back end or the data tier uses Microsoft SQL Server and ArcGIS Server. Integration with Active Directory allows for permissions management. So when a user visits the CDMS site, the browser loads the JavaScript web application into memory. The web application runs in the user's browser and requests data and pages from the REST API service endpoints. Those REST API endpoints call the database as needed. We continue to actively work on improving the speed which data is fetched from the stored tables and displayed in the web interface. We keep up to date with our libraries and our AG grid licensing, which improves the user experience. We're constantly you know, kind of in touch with the database system of how it's operating, how our users can use it, and what can we do to make it better for them. Our core architecture has evolved a bit over the years and gotten more complicated, as you can imagine. And we've de developed data sets which may deviate from our standard header and rows configurations. Of course, over time, we've wanted more, we wanted our data management system to do more for us. And we, we can manage this kind of flexibility and change because the core system of tables is so, um, so easily adaptable to additional um, structures built within it. So we're able to use the system to bring in data from other agencies, as well as push data out to agencies or individuals with approved data sharing requirements. This makes the system robust at meeting our partnering agencies needs. There are currently 22 fisheries data sets and we have over 100 users in the system with four state and federal databases which we push data out to. So we're utilizing our SQL Server and our web-based data management system to store any type of spatial and tabular information which is collected on at least an annual recurring basis. We have many different workflow solutions in the CDMS system. The example I'm going to show today is for the RED survey. RED surveys are done on a specific stream reach in multiple basins in Eastern Oregon and Southeast Washington. And here's a picture of our fisheries biologist, Travis Olson, doing a stream survey on the South Fork of the Walla Walla River in the fall of 2019. It's always nice to see people out there actually working when you're doing a PowerPoint presentation on technology. Travis was one of our early adopters of the survey form for field data collection. We like using the Survey123 app, as I'm sure many of you out there have used before too. Uh, the forms are easy to set up and deploy within our portal. Whether you're collecting data for a red or a carcass, the corresponding attributes will all be shown as options in the form. Multiple types of information can be collected with their corresponding attributes within one form. So it makes it very easy for the user to move through. In our on-site portal, we have a fisheries group where users can easily access applications to QA, QC, the data, which they may have just collected in the field. 
We've also created a gallery in the portal where fisheries biologists can access views of data which come out of the CDMS system as, as GIS layers into maps. Accessing ArcGIS desktop, we've found, um, as we're all working from home now, um, accessing ArcGIS desktop over VPN is incredibly difficult um, with a central licensing server. So most folks are now doing, um, accessing their, their information in, in our portal um, from web maps. And here is uh, one web application for the spawning ground surveys. The dots are activities which are collect which have been collected. The red dots are for red collections. Um, blue is for a live fish, and orange is an observation. Within the app, users can easily identify at a glance the different feature types collected. All these attributes are editable if you have the proper permissions. And here is a view of those editing capabilities. It's an easy to navigate user interface. Um, and so editing and updating information has, we haven't had any problems with it. After QAQCing the data, the user can click on our geoprocessing tool, which we custom made and put into the application. Uh, the tool checks to see if there are new updated records and syncs those back into the database. So after checking data in the web map, users can then go and log into the CDMS system. And here's the login page for the system. And here's the Walla Walla Basin m and &E Group's project page. On this page, they can update their metadata for their project, which we just heard about from Amanda. Uh, this is a great presentation on metadata. Got me thinking about quite a few things that I'm going to be looking into after this presentation. But the metadata that our uh, biologists enter here is reused in their individual websites. So everything entered into the CDMS system has the potential to be used in other web-based applications, specifically for outreach, education, and summary reporting at this point. And within their project, they can store pictures, documents, reports, um, upload any type of file they would want to. The user can access the data which belongs to them from their project page. While we have many projects which collect the same types of data, each project will only see the data that they collect based on their user login. They access their data by going to the activity page. An activity is one upload of data in a data set. So each activity is recorded here and the user can click on it to see data for that event. We have changed or history tracking on all the data sets and if needed could document the updates which have been done to that data. And you can click on an activity and here you can see the actual data collected in the survey 123 form. It's a couple of steps to get into each upload of data, but this allows us to logically um, store the data in a way that mimics the workflow of the data collectors. And we also utilize SQL Server reports to provide summaries of the data. These summaries often meet the end of the year reporting requirements for many of the data collectors. And the reports can also be shared to collaborating partners if needed. So we are leveraging all the data and information from the CDMS system in multiple ways. And web maps and apps on our ArcGIS Online site have become quite popular. From here, we can provide access to uh, the imp summary information, and we can manage permissions for either public or limited group access. We've also purchased the domain names for five basins that the fisheries department is collecting data in. So we can create custom websites for the, each biologist to use as outreach and education. Here's the TucannonRiver.org site, and from this site, um, story maps can be accessed as well as reports and data. These documents are shared directly, as I mentioned, out of the CDMS system. So documents are saved in one location and shared out for access. This content is managed by the biologist. Uh, while GIS creates the containers for storage of the content, the biologists manage which content is accessible. 
the CDMS system and the ArcGIS library have allowed us to more efficiently create story maps and provide access to information. So here's a story map about how they use LIDAR in the Toucanon Basin to show changes over time. And one of our more popular sites we have is the public access to fish count information. This is data from the CDMS system, um, the Weir's data set, and is only CTIR collected data. And by investing in a web-based system, it's allowed us to create collaborations to display data from other entities. We provide access to pit tag data summaries and water temperature data for the Walla Walla Basin. This data is provided via a live link to us from the Walla Walla Basin Watershed Council. So the CDMS system is utilized, um, or I should say also, the CDMS system is utilized by three tribes and CRIPFIC. While CTR developed the system, we have shared the system to the tribes and the Columbia River Intertribal Fisheries Commission in order to pool our knowledge and skills to more quickly develop modules and features for the system. Each separate entity hosts their own system, and we use GitHub to share updates and improvements that we come out with periodically. It's, it's difficult and challenging for some tribal governments, which are located often in rural areas, to attract and retain skilled web programmers and developers. And so by working together, we're benefiting from each other's knowledge and um, skill set. So by investing in a database system, we're now able to quickly access and efficiently use information on multiple platforms. Thank you for joining me today to get a brief introduction into our information management system at the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation. Great, Stacy. Thank you so much. We're going to go ahead and open it up to questions. Um, as, as before, you can either type your message in the chat or you can click on the raised hand icon in the toolbar. Um, there is a question about accessing the recording and yes, these will be um, recorded and made available on the PNAM ETIS website. So did anybody have any further questions for either of our speakers, for either Amanda or Stacy? Oh, this is that's a great question. Um, Stacy, this is for you. What is the one thing or feature you would like to add to your system? We've been so focused on trying to get the data into the system and, and working with folks to use the system um, that we're just really now getting into that the portion of creating you know really cool modules that geoprocessing tool i showed and, and the integration of the sur survey one two three forms directly into the database system was something we just really completed over the last six months and was a big leap for us so um i'm not sure i i've moved on yet from that <laughs> okay um Another question for Stacy: Has this database been set up to help tribes upload water quality data to the WQX slash store it? It 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 is it does help because all of the data is in one location, so we can pull all of the data out and then um, send it into the WQX system. Um, but over over time, like the WQX has changed a little bit of their standards. And so occasionally we have to rework our system to match their system if you wanted it to go auto magically, you know, directly. And so right now we're at that point where we, we at least can pull all of the data out. We don't have to go talk to 10 different people to collectively gather their data. And that's made it way more efficient use of time. Great. And for your metadata, did you follow an existing format from another metadata platform, such as Data One. I we, we did not, um, but I am going to look into that. Um, being of a GIS background, I use the ISO um, mm -hmm. system, and I'm, I'm much more familiar with that, but I am very interested in learning about different types of metadata systems. Okay, great. And have you attempted putting past data into the database? 
Yes, we've had to work with a lot of um, older data sets that maybe didn't meet the current standards. Um, you know, data collection strategies do change quite a bit over time, and uh, it's it's a um, it's a lot of hours to compile historical data and get it in, but it's well worth it once you get it done. So we did undertake quite a bit of that. Okay, um, just leave it open for another 30 seconds or so to get in any more questions you all have. Okay, well, I'm not seeing any more questions, so I will hand it back over to Nancy. I want to thank all of you for attending today. It's our first data um, webinar of a three-part series. I'm hoping that we will see you uh, at our next upcoming webinars. I also want to take the time to thank our speakers, Amanda and Stacy, for a really great um, presentations. I know I've got some good ideas that will probably uh, worry some of the folks I work with. <laughs> Uh, we did record today's webinar, like we mentioned, and Amy uh, put the link in the chat. So you can find that. If you're interested in learning about other future PNEP events, including other data management topics that we'll be tackling in the near uh, and as well distant future, you can join the PNEP newsletter. Amy's going to put the link in the chat in case you're not already receiving the PNAP newsletter. And uh, we'll keep you posted on all these uh, up to date events that will be happening. You can take a look at the PNAP ETIS uh, web page. I'm not sure if, uh, if you've all uh, come across that web page or not, but um, if you go to PNAP.org, you'll also be able to see anything else that will be happening under the Emerging Technology Information uh, Series in the next coming months and uh, also hopefully next year when we'll have our other face-to-face -face conference. Uh, just to highlight our, our next two webinars that are scheduled, we have our next one on next Thursday on February 18th. Where we'll have two presenters uh, addressing topics related to data visual visualization and spatial web apps. And then our final uh, webinar will be on February 25th, uh, also starting at 1 p.m. Pacific time. And we'll have um, two presenters talking about best practices for data sharing and also uh, getting into a bit more detail on the ethics of data sharing in the environmental science world, including um, indigenous data sharing. And that concludes today's webinar. Thank you for sticking around to the end and have a great day.